Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and a um, little change of scene here tonight. Uh, we're going to try some technology and uh, uh, talk uh, in, a, in an interview with a renowned epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Steve Wing, who's at the uh, University of North Carolina. Steve and I spoke together uh, in Harrisburg uh, about two and a half years ago on Three Mile Island, and um, Steve's longer presentation about the health effects of Three Mile Island is on our website. Um, you can find it there. So, Steve, well, we've been getting lots of questions about is there a safe amount of radiation? Well, the, uh, the, the general, generally accepted thinking about the safe dose is that no, there is no safe dose in terms of the cancer or genetic effects of radiation. There's, uh, the assumption is that, of, of most people, is that there's a linear, no threshold dose response relationship. And that just means that as the dose goes down, the risk dose goes down, but it never disappears. So, so in, in terms of Fukushima, then, um, the people near to the reactor would obviously have much higher dose, and the people, um, you know, on this side of the Pacific Ocean would have, would have much lower. But so the, the contamination, then, is getting spread out. That's right. So, um, of course, when the, the Fukushima situation first started, we heard lots of news media talking about there's no threat to health, which just flies in the face of all the standard models and all the studies that have been done over a long period of time of radiation and cancer. And they could have been talking about acute effects, and those occur only at higher doses, such as the types of doses that the workers are receiving at the plant, some of the workers. But as the radiation clouds move away from Fukushima and move far away uh, to other continents and around the world, the doses are spread out. But it's important for people to know that spreading out a given amount of radiation dose among more people, although it reduces each person's individual risk, it doesn't reduce the number of cancers that result from that amount of radiation. So having millions and millions of people exposed to a very small dose could produce just as much cancer as the as a thousand or a few thousand people exposed to that same dose. So we're, let's put aside for a minute the people that are working there <clears throat> because they're getting extraordinarily high doses and in some cases, um, that probably increased the likelihood of cancer by, you know, 10 or 20 percent because of the, the radiation they got. But for the, the civilians who are not, uh, are, are not members of the staff, um, what does that mean for the, the continental U.S. in general? Well, that's a question a lot of people have right now, is that they are concerned. Should they take iodine? Should they avoid certain foods? Uh, should they move? And that kind of thing. Um, and what I, I would suggest to people thinking about that is that as the contamination from Fukushima is spread out, it's just more difficult to avoid exposure by changing your behavior, your eating habits, or where you live. Now, it, it, if you live near Fukushima, you can move away. And it makes a big difference because the doses there are very high. But the doses here are much, much lower. So in North America, it would be, it's much more difficult to change your dose in any significant way by moving or changing your diet. Now, this is in part because we don't know that much about exactly how contaminated any place or any food is. But still, the doses are much, much lower. Uh, so if, if 
I, I would encourage people not to become too concerned about themselves only, uh, because there's another problem, which is that if people focus exclusively on the concern about radiation from Fukushima, they could become distracted from other sources of radiation or other types of exposures in air and water and food that can cause cancer. And so it, it's, the world is complex. And it's, for those of us far away, it's very much hard to treat this as something that we can handle ourselves as individuals. Now, it, it, in, in, it, that's, that's a little bit different when it comes to the, our public officials. They have the capacity to issue uh, uh, statements about what things to avoid when they find, if they find contamination. And that's very important. So they have a, the potential to be able to influence the food supply or to make recommendations that can be followed by thousands or millions of people. Uh, and, and I'm certainly supportive of that in the event that contamination is found that people can avoid. So in, a, in an earlier uh, video, I was talking about how I felt that the, uh, the FDA should be sampling uh, fish in the Pacific, um, especially the ones that are up, up in the food chain, the tuna and the salmon and things like that. And, and that's an appropriate public health response. But for, uh, for an individual catching a trout on a stream in Idaho, um, uh, to worry about that particular fish is, is, not a, is, is not a reasonable idea? Yeah, I think there are probably other things more important to worry about, including other sources of radiation. OK. So if you. Um, uh, so you're basically suggesting that as a, as a collective, as, as, the, as the country as a whole, or, or perhaps the, 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 the world, but certainly the closer you get the, 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 the Pacific coast, et cetera, as a collective group, we should, be, um, um, we should be concerned, and there will be cancers, but also as individuals on this side of the Pacific, there's not much to do to uh, that, that changes the likelihood that, that you'll be it. Is that right? That's true. I think that's a good way to put it. I, I think w what to me as a public health response, that what, what's most important for us is to, uh, to be involved in taking collective action, which means that uh, we should be focusing on putting pressure on people in government and in the energy industry to come up with an energy policy that minimizes harm. And right now, that it's a very complicated thing to do, but building nuclear power plants that are uh, potentially going to have problems like what we're seeing at Fukushima or other problems that we have not yet observed uh, just as the problems at Fukushima had never been observed in the history of the nuclear industry before. Uh, that we need to be more creative about imagining what things might happen and, and working towards a more sane energy policy. You know, I was talking recently, and, and the, the three big accidents in my career, uh, Three Mile Island in 79 and, and then uh, Chernobyl in 86 and now this one, um, they all happened for reasons that the experts never anticipated. And I think that uh, you know, when you look at uh, the, the unknown unknowns, if we were going to quote uh, famous people in the past, that uh, really when we're looking at this technology, it seems like the things we plan for are not what happens, but the things that we, um, we don't know or, or underestimate or it comes around and, and causes the, uh, the accidents. That's very true. So adopting technologies that minimize the consequences of something unforeseen, I, I would argue, is, is, a key, uh, is a key idea for all of us 
to think about and to become involved in uh, in our civic life, working for those kinds of changes at the local level, at our uh, national level, and internationally. Because these are problems that will go on for a very long time. In the case of the nuclear industry, we have spent fuel that is being stored on site, and which is one of the big problems at Fukushima. And we have as yet to determine its final fate. And, and so there are big problems that I'm afraid those who have led us into this situation have not fully faced. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and uh, um, we'll touch base with you as this develops. If, um, if there is a rain out, a significant uh, radiation deposition on uh, the United States, um, we'll get you back on, because I think you know, our discussion was low level spread over a lot of people. But right. uh, you know, if we do have uh, a lot of precipitation that drives a lot of radiation into a local area, we'll definitely get you back on. Good to be with you. Well, thank you. And um, next, uh, as things develop, we'll get back to you. Fairwinds, Arnie Gunderson. Good night.